Bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Welcome to the Latin American presentation. This is a glimpse into the work of God and people from the 16th century to the present day. In this presentation, you will learn about specific people and influences, specifically in the politics and health, as well as how certain areas, such as Argentina and Guatemala, are responding to the history of religion within their communities and areas. You will also learn a little bit more about evangelism and social justice work within Guatemala. As we covered in our readings in previous lectures, the Spanish and Portuguese had the major influence within the Latin American region. Spain's goal was that of evangelism, but the products and prizes of the New World would be as tempting as any soul for God. During the 16th century, a variety of conquistadors landed throughout Latin America. Pizarro found his way into the area of Peru, where we meet the Incas. The Inca natives had great power before new people came, but with him Pizarro brought smallpox and other diseases that wiped out the Incan political structure. Tupac Amaru, born in 1545, was the Peruvian Inca state's last native ruler and was executed very violently by the power of the local Spanish viscery in 1572. Unfortunately, King Philip II in Spain had disapproved of this. With his death, the Incan Empire ended. Amaru heads a, a Latin American ideological lineage kept alive by individuals and groups fighting for native rights and rules, many of whom who've ta have taken the name of Tupac, including Tupac Amaru II, Tupac Katari, and even the rapper-theologian of the 1990s, Tupac Shakir, in America. Casa means lineage or breed or race. It's from the Latin castus or chase to a lineage of quote-unquote purity. Um, it's a Spanish colonial concept use of mixed races after conquest, mostly for social control. Um, people of mixed races were called castas as a group. Um, this is all based on the idea that character is related to your birth. Um, the Spanish state and the church took more tax or tribute in the church's case from people of lower quote-unquote ranks. Um, and Spanish in America came to be came to expect to be treated like nobility, even if they weren't originally born into that. Um, the biggest uh, category is Española, Peninsular, Criollo, or maybe it's Criollo. I'm not sure. Indio and Negro. Española was um, considered one of the three original races um, in the Spanish New World, along with Native American and African. Um, it could also describe um, a non-Hispanic non European who had come to the New World and acculturated to Spanish ways. Um, Peninsular would mean Spanish-born and of Spanish descent. Um, Spain had actually ruled its territories with a class of folks who were called Peninsular. Um, they didn't usually come from the territory itself or permanently lived there. Um, these folks moved, were, were moved throughout the empire to rule and would only stay a couple of years in any one place. Um, so these folks were called peninsular. You could also be called peninsular if you were an, a Spanish descent immigrant from Spain in the New World um, and, and you had permanently settled but weren't appoint, an appointed leader. Um, Criollo or Criollo uh, meant New World born and of Spanish or European white descent. Um, they tended to be given um, low-level government jobs, but they could move up. They could own land and businesses. Many were wealthy and treated as nobility, though most were middle class or poor. Uh, Indio meant New World born and of native descent. They had the legal standing of minors, actually, and they were meant to be or, on paper, they were to be protected uh, by officials like a minor would, but they were often actually abused. Um, and many had been born into royalty in their own context, um, and these folks would be assimilated into Spanish nobility through marriage, and then that native royalty would, would 
loosely defined by European standards. Um, Negro meant sub, of sub-Saharan African descent. They were legally prohibited from many positions, including priesthood, um, and Negro's court testimony was not as highly valued as that from other folks. Um, Negroes could join segregated Negro militia. So. A um, couple of other categories. Mestizo meant half Spanish, half Native American. This was associated with illegitimacy because after conquest, mixed race kids were, who were born in wedlock were either assigned a Native American or a Spanish identity, not a Mestizo. Um, though by the end of the 17th century, there was actually quite a big community of these Mestizos and probably a lot of them were born in wedlock. Um, mulatto meant half Spanish or Native American and half African. For mulattoes, if um, one's mother was a slave, then the, that the child would be born into slavery. Uh, Zambo meant mixed Native and African. And there were hundreds of other terms to express different degrees of mixture. Um, just a couple of little personal notes. Um, I have been very close with some Mexicans from Mexico and um, have been told that even today in Latin America, the fairer your skin is, the higher in status you'll be considered to be. And I have heard my friends use the term Indio to, to describe a Hispanic person with dark skin. So I don't know so what that's worth. OK, we will end this right here. Thank you. A new genre of art um, came about with the Spanish colonial called Pinturas de Casta, um, painting of the Castas, uh, probably influenced somewhat by Enlightenment thought and Enlightenment, you know, desire to categorize and describe things, you know, quote unquote scientifically. Um, these paintings showed the different racial combinations in Spanish territories um, with a sort of an exotic flavor. Um, most of them consist of, well, it's like one big painting holding 16 smaller paintings showing 16 different racial combinations. And the paintings give a lot of clues to both to thoughts about race among officials at the time and probably about Spanish New World colonial like identity, um, how they would like to have wanted to be seen. Um, the audiences for these paintings were largely European. Um, of course, Spanish supremacy is the main theme. Um, paintings imply that natives could become Spaniards um, through miscegenation with Spaniards. Uh, and that mixing with Africans would make Spaniards regress to what they thought of as an earlier time in racial development. Um, the paintings usually show descendants of natives becoming Spanish after three generations of intermarriage with Spaniards. Um, the paintings show mixtures with Africans, both by natives and by Spaniards, leading into disorder, um, not into a new racial type. And so there's clearly a racial bias against Africans. Um, the, in New Spain, the Casta paintings show where each person in the New World ranks in the system. Um, you see an orderly, hierarchical society where your socioeconomic status depends on your skin color and your quote unquote purity of blood. Uh, Spanish had a phrase for that, limpieza de sangre. Um, the paintings were popular in Spain and other parts of Europe. Um, some paintings also link character, like explicitly link character to ethnicity. Um, in one, uh, a mestizo is called generally humble, tranquil, and straightforward. Um, in another, you see uh, the claim that from a lobo, an Indian woman is born the cambujo. One usually slow, lazy, and cumbersome. So, yeah. Um, I think that is all for this this slide. I hope that is sort of clear and self-explanatory. Thank you. So, what is smallpox? Um, it's an airborne virus. thrives in dense communities. 
uh, looks like pustules which release infectious smallpox DNA into the air and surfaces when they're punctured. Um, there's an incubation of period of 12 days, and by the by that mark of 12 days, you've either died or survived. But during that time, um, you can infect others if you're carrying a uh, smallpox virus. Um, it came from Eurasian ancestors of New World conquerors, or the Spanish, um, who had lived for thousands of years with domesticated animals. Um, but over generations, animal infections, domesticated animal infections, crossed species and went to humans um, and evolved into strains like smallpox and were deadly to many humans. Um, smallpox and other, other uh, diseases uh, crossing species like, like smallpox um, had erupted in plagues throughout Eurasian history um, and survivors would acquire and pass antibodies and immunities onto the next generation which made Europeans increasingly immune over generations to viruses like smallpox. Um, it's thought to have come to the Americas in 1520 on a Spanish ship from Cuba carried by an infected African slave. Um, it either landed in Mexico or maybe Colombia, some people say, um, but in fact, infection spread quickly uh, throughout Central and South America from there. It may have, which may have been helped by the Incan road system, which was in place already there. Um, from that time until 1618, epidemics like smallpox and typhus, influenza, diphtheria, and measles killed different people say different things, but roughly 60 to 90 percent, or 94 percent, I should say, of the Incan population. And Incan, Incans were the largest empire in pre-Columbian America. So why were these folks so susceptible? Um, they had only domesticated one large animal, which was the llama, and that was in a very isolated area. Um, they were only occasionally eaten, and they weren't in kept indoors or milked. So viral animal infections like smallpox hadn't yet had a chance to cross over to humans. Um, it's cool. Uh, European smallpox had already devastated the Incas before Pizarro arrived in 1526. Um, smallpox had killed the Indian, I'm sorry, the Incan Empire Emperor Juana Capac. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right and unleashed a civil war that distracted and weakened his successor, um, Atta Huayrofa. Um, I've got one question that might be relevant for us as Christians around the epidemics. I mean, the idea of host and, you know, the body is a host of the virus. Um, are the Christian metaphors of host and hospitality relevant to our Christian understanding of the devastation of the new world by Europeans through diseases like smallpox? Just something to think about. Okay, that is our smallpox slide. Thank you.
So how did this group become successful? Um, number one, they honored God in everything they did. Um, the Reducciones were the missions that were spread all, all around Argentina for about 150 years. Um, this particular group in 1609 were called the Indios group, and they were guided by the Jesuits. Um, and they had advanced laws. They, f they founded a number of, you know, sort of cutting-edge um, you know, cutting edge things for their time, right? So they they uh, they started free public services for the poor. They founded a number of schools, hospitals. They established birth control, which I think is quite fascinating that a Catholic group uh, in the early 1600s would think along those lines. And they suppressed the death penalty. Uh, this society was based on principles of primitive Christianity, and it was established and. Um, it was, it was like I said, incredibly, incredibly successful. All the inhabitants in the community would work the land, and they, they uh, were, were quite skilled in their handicraft of uh, sculpturing and woodcraft. Um, everybody in the society was literate, and um, you know they, they actually put. Um, you know their products for sale. They, their their economy was was quite thriving. Uh, they produced products such as watches, musical instruments, and uh, the other thing that I think was quite interesting is that the typical workday in Europe, uh, well, you know, uh, in Latin America, run by Europe, was about a twelve to fourteen hour workday. Um, this particular community had a six hour workday. And they really celebrated the free time that was dedicated to music, dance, and uh, they were quite well known for their bow and arrow, sh you know, their bow shot contest. Um, they also spent a considerable, considerable amount of time in prayer and worship to God. Um, you take these sorts of concepts and put them in a community and... Uh, have this lived out for 150 years, it becomes quite attractive, and this group really did thrive uh, during their day. The Indios uh, group, uh, this Jesuit uh, mission that was, uh, again, founded in 1609, uh, centered their life around the community. They uh, developed you know their town, and uh, this picture here is just a, st a structure, an old relic of uh, of what what their group sort of looked like. They had um, you know concentrated their main buildings with churches and and schools, like I had mentioned in the previous slide that they valued education. Um, they also had their hospitals and what have you uh, in this in this in this space. What happened over time is that. A hundred thousand, uh, anywhere between a hundred thousand and three hundred thousand um, Argentinians uh, converted to Catholicism as a result of this type of living. Um, some Reducciones uh, missions that were sent along Argentina numbered about twenty thousand inhabitants. So they would, you know, it was part of their sort of evangelization process. They would develop a community, and uh, these communities were sort of separate from, you know, the government of the day. It was uh, Spanish rule, um, and the King of Spain allowed these groups to kind of operate independently for about 150 years. Um, they really did thrive, and like I said, their economy, um, they, they, were a, they were a big asset to, the, to the, uh, the, the, the country at large because of what they produced and how they lived their lives. Um, working 12 to 14 hour days in one neighborhood, then you come to this community, and they're working a six-hour day, and they're celebrating life in a way that was quite uh, radical for uh, a 17th century uh, Latin America uh, person of Latin American descent. So, why did this group uh, last 150 years and not longer? Uh, trouble started in about 1750 when the King of Spain ceded a portion of the territory uh, that w was sort of given independence to the Indios group, the Jesuit group, uh, to the Portuguese. The Portuguese wanted to take sort of economic advantage <clears throat> of this group because they were sort of successful. And um, as you can imagine, imagine the Jesuits uh, pushed back 
and uh, a war took place um, in 1756, and the the Indios group was defeated, um, which sort of led to the expulsion of this group in 1767. And they never quite recovered from that war. Uh, the more powerful um, you know, Portuguese um, took over, and that was sort of the beginning of the end of this, uh, this Jesuit group. But in that 150 years, they had remarkable examples of how to sort of live your life dedicated to these Jesuit principles. And um, you, would, you would see sort of remarkable examples of art um, and product, production and a way of life that was quite contrary to the way others had lived. And to what they would say was they were very authentic to the gospel narrative and the way that they lived it out um, in, a, in, a, in a pretty pretty remarkable way, in my opinion. To this day, you would see um, this group, remnants of the uh, Indios group, the Reducciones, the Guarani Comunidad, um, in Argentina, right at the border of Paraguay and Argentina. Now the group is quite small, but they're still guided by the same principles that uh, this, Je the, you know, the first Jesuit mission um, ha had instilled in, in the group and how they lived for uh, 150 years thriving in, in that type of community. Um, so if you went there today, you would see this group, and there's a picture here of uh, some of the, the um, Argentinians that live in in this uh, this community, it's quite inspiring to me. I, I think it's you know what a radical example of, of living counterculturally, um, and how you know the, you know the legacy is is quite uh, quite interesting. It's you know it's amazing how um, when you choose to honor God with your life, uh, what kind of examples it leads to the others uh, that are looking uh, looking and seeing, you know, your life thriving. Tupac Amaru II followed the first from the 16th century. Born Jose Gabriel Condor Canqui in 1742, this Peruvian mitizo claimed lineage to Amaru. He was Jesuit educated and was called a Marquis by local Spanish authorities. He also had local influence under Spanish rule and at one point governed an inherited chiefdom for the Spanish governor. He identified with the Andean Indian er, natives, however, the Incas, most of whom were being forced into public work projects. The little money these natives were earning was heavily taxed by the Spanish government and further diminished by the Catholic Church through collections, forced gifts, and domestic and um, parochial work. The quote-unquote free natives were also heavily taxed. After many of Jose's efforts to ease natives' lives through his political work had failed, he organized a rebellion and changed his name to Tupac Amaru II, claiming his lineage. He spoke out to the Spanish rulers and churches. He said to, in criticism of the colonial oppression in 1781, quote, a humble youth with a staff and sling and a rustic shepherd with the help of divine provid providence freed the unhappy people of Israel from the power of Goliath and Pharaoh the reason was that the tears of those poor captives raised such voices of compassion pleading for justice from heaven that in a few years they left their martyrdom and torment for the promised land. Oh, but oh, in the end they attained their wish with such sobbing and crying. But we, the unhappy Indians, though we sigh and weep more than they, in so many centuries have not been able to find relief. And although our monarch, in his royal eminence and sovereignty, has seen fit to free us with his royal sedulo, his procul proclamation, this relief and kindness has brought us greater anxiety, temporal and spiritual ruin. The reason is that the Pharaoh who pursues, mistreats, and abuses us is not one but many. So iniquitous and depraved are the um, 
Giodorus, their lieutenants, tax collectors, and other enforcers, diabolical and perverse men, to be sure, who must have been born from the gloomy chaos of hell and sucked out at the breasts of the most disagreeable harpies who are so ungodly, cruel, and tyrannical that they make great saints of the Neros and Attalas, whose iniquities are remembered in history so that just to hear of them makes the body tremble and the heart cry out. As you can hear, he was passionate about uh, identifying the Andean Indians as something more than oppressed people. Amaru II uh, mobilized thousands of natives against local Spanish authorities and was sometimes successful, but the rebels, now with a freedom and energy, could not always be controlled. After a six-month struggle, he and his family ended up being executed. He died in the same location as uh, Tupac Amaru to a bloody death, and the outlawing of in, uh, Inca cultural identification took place. This was the first large rebellion in Spanish territories, which inspired many similar struggles. They sought justice and inequality, excuse me, justice and equality that even the church at different times had denied. Just as we saw revolts continuing after Tupac Amaru II's death in Peru, we also see revolts outside of Peru, as in the instance of Camonero Revolt in Colombia in 1981 and in Brazil, where people indicated their unhappiness with the Portuguese administration. There was an, an overwhelming urge for independence throughout Latin America. Meanwhile, Spain and Portugal were losing their power. The 1783 Treaty of Paris saw Spain providing its signature that would give America its independence. The French Revolution gave rise to French people in the New World fleeing to Cuba, Mexico, and Venezuela. Spain had joined Britain in a war against France, but after that defeat, sided with France and left the Spanish crown completely bankrupt. By the first quarter of the 19th century, Latin American countries had gained independence, and in part, that was due to the struggles happening across the, ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. Now the revolutionists had to decide how the countries would be structured. Liberals and conservatives had different views. The liberals sought to follow a model based on, more on a, America and its new government, while the conservatives held on to the monarch structure of the old world. No matter how the New World lo would look, they agreed on two things. There would be economic transformation, and somehow the government had to keep control of the masses. The Catholic Church had an interestingly gross power, amount of power during the 19th century. The Catholic Church was the colonial institution that did survive independence, and the ways and the authority inherent within that institution survived as well. Their power came through wealth, education, and access. For the most part, clergy had a great many advantages over the masses and even the political leaders. The church owned 80% of the land in some of the provinces of New Spain. The church's wealth came from, most, from mortgages and interest collected on all its property. Clergy had prestige from education, and they were involved in politics, creating many circles of influence and power. Most importantly, to maintain this power <clears throat> was the fact that the masses had much more contact with the church than, it ever, than they ever did with political officials. Liberals thought that the church was a threat to the state. Some officials sought more state control over religious patronage. Liberals and conservatives would debate about the church for the next 50 years of politics in the new states. During the decades of independence throughout Latin America, there arose conflict between the Catholic Church and the Latin American chiefs. The chiefs of the new nation-states claimed the right to exercise national patronage as heirs of the formal royal patronage. The Pope, however, said that patronage was to be returned to the papacy with the declarations of independence. Thus, the Catholic Church gained more control with the country's independence, 
while still maintaining the control and power it had before independence. This power and influence would dissipate as new governments gained traction and national identities developed as religious and civil states. A couple centuries following the independence from Spain, another religious political way resulted in a changed landscape and identity within Latin America. From 1962 to 1965, Vatican II convened and the pastoral constitution of the Church of the Modern World in the modern world was created. The Catholic Church was urging the people not to shirk their responsibilities to the poor and oppressed. Priests and nuns responded by becoming involved in social organizing. The greatest impact was felt in Latin America, where economic and social inequalities were severe. Post-Vatican II, the Latin American Episcopal Conferences, held in 1968 and 79, influenced liberation theology's development and the application of Vatican II to Latin America in light of this new theology. The Latin American theologians developed a doctrine based on Luke 4, 18 through 21. Pope Paul VI, who was the presiding pope at the end of Vatican II, said, We wish to personify the Christ of a poor and hungry people. Bishops prioritized social justice. They informed the masses um, to make them aware of the exploitive nature of the social system in which they lived, and they rejected Marxist atheist worldview. Christian-based communities were developed. These were lay Bible groups which received the bishop's blessing. Due to the shortage of ordained clergy, these groups were mainly made of poor people in the countryside and yet considered the delegates of the word. They led the communities in reading the Bible through the lens of social justice. Priests also joined government. The Sandinista government in Nicaragua is an example of how the religious movement of liberation theology influenced this government's new way. The Sandinista government had made radical changes in 1979 after an 18-year battle against the dictator. By 1980, literacy, a literacy campaign reduced illiteracy from 52 to 12 percent. They built more skills, made education free from preschool through graduate studies. They expanded health care and redistributed land to cooperatives. An influential character in liberation theology is Gustavo Gutierrez. He is a Peruvian theologian theologian and Dominican priest who coined the term uh, liberation theology in 1968. There were Christian groups like the Catholic Worker who were already practicing many of the ideas Gutierrez and other theologians were articulating at this time. These ideas that they were concerned about created questions such as, what is the relationship between Christian theology and political activism? And what does that have to do with social and economic justice? Should Christian social action follow from scriptures which say Jesus brings a sword and not peace? Is Jesus' mission worldly uh, justice? Should humans take responsibility for their destinies while accepting Jesus' liberation of humanity from sin and its consequences, including oppression? These were the ideas and questions that liberation theologians were wrestling with. And this theology found action um, as a crucial adversary to the right-wing governments during the 1970s and 80s. Arch Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador was one such person. He often visited the poor in his parish and observed the um, great oppression firsthand the Salvadorian government was destroying the people and the country, aided by $1.5 million coming from the United States daily. After writing President Jimmy Carter to stop sending the aid to the government, he spoke directly to the ar army in his Sunday homily. He preached, Brothers, you are from the same people. 
No soldier is obliged to obey an order that is contrary to the will of God. In the name of God, then, in the name of this suffering people, I ask you, I beg you, I command you, in the name of God, stop the oppression. The next day, Romero was assassinated while saying Mass, and the crowds of mourners at his funeral were also greeted by gunfire. Other priests and bishops and nuns um, met similar atrocities in Brazil. 120 of them were arrested between 1968 and 1978, along with 300 Catholic lay workers who were arrested. Still, not all leaders in the Catholic Church approved of liberation theology. Many church hierarchy fought against liberation theology and supported dictatorships. Others said church should not actively be involved in the struggle. Va the Vatican attacked liberation theology, and Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger silenced the Brazilian priest Leonardo Both, who was a founder of this th theological movement. Both left the Franciscan order, and Ratzinger became Pope Benedict the Sixteenth in 2005. Liberation theology is still influential in Latin America, and many Americans and seminarians are embracing the theology as they try to understand their roles as neighbors to the North. Now let us look at a brief overview of the religious influence of Guatemala starting in the Though Protestant missionaries began and continued to travel to Guatemala primarily in 1873, another very important change took place with the election. In 1960, Guatemala entered a long and brutal civil war. That Today, over 14 million people make up the nation of Guatemala. In this section, we'll be talking about poverty, culture, and social evangelism, and bringing hope to a broken and unforgotten Guatemala. We have seen in the video a different kind of Guatemala, the other side of Guatemala. Now, let's speak a little bit about the people. The people of Guatemala, they're a unique culture, a combination of Mayan practices and Spanish colonial heritage. Approximately 50% of the population is mestizo a mix of American and Spanish called Ladino by the people of Guatemala. The remainder of the population identifies themselves with being European, Quiche, Cachiquel, Mam, Quechi, or other Mayan and non-Mayan groups. The majority of people, the vast diversity of ethnicity, results in nearly 21 different languages. Many indigenous people follow traditional religion and social customs a rich tradition of textiles and other handcraft is what dominates their industry. This same population practices spiritual acts that are rooted in the country's histories prior to the Civil War, sometimes blending elements of Roman Catholicism. The majority of the population identify themselves as being Roman Catholic, Protestant, or part of a Mayan Catholic fusion. The 14 million people of Guatemala thrive on the country's fertile land as 52% of the population is engaged in agriculture work. Guatemala has traditionally produced a variety of natural exports including coffee, sugar, bananas, and vegetables. The urban areas, however, are heavily influenced by Europe and North American trends. The diversity between the urban, modern ways of practicing in Guatemala City, the hub of cultural activity, and the traditional practices and customs of the Mayan population give Guatemala a colorful and unique culture. 
1996, the country emerged from a 36-year-long civil war. It devastated the country. In 2009, the country declared a state of public calamity. The Dry Corridor is located in the eastern part of Guatemala. It is a corridor that destroys lives. About 54,000 people go hungry on a daily basis. According to UNICEF, nearly 49.8% of children suffer from malnutrition. That is the highest in the region and the fourth highest in the world. As a result, 75% of the country's population are below poverty line. Illiteracy, infant mortality, maternal mortality, and starvation are among the highest in the region. Infectious diseases even complicate the issue even further. Foodborne and waterborne illnesses such as bacteria, diarrhea, hepatitis A, typhoid, fevers are very common. And dengue as well as malaria and other diseases are destroying children's lives. This country, though beautiful in appearance, it's overwhelmed by crime, poverty, and severe malnutrition. So what are we going to do? We need to engage in a social kind of evangelism so that we bring hope to these broken lives.